All righty, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Woodbury Village of Woodbury Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. If we could please rise for a pledge to the flag, even though we don't have a flag. Craig is gonna share his screen. Oh, there we go, thank you. There you go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And prayers for the people in Ukraine. Okay. okay. Nice job, like Nice job. <laughs> that was your flag, Craig. Thank you. All right. Um, again, welcome to our village meeting. Um, we meet the second Wednesday of each month. Our next meeting is on April 13th. Um, possibly in person. Be a while. It's been a while since we've met in person. Took a year before I met Andrew. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'd like to introduce our board members. Um, I'm going to go across on my screen. I don't know what your screen looks like. Um, we have Andrew Zumas. Good evening. Zumas. We have Mr. Kevin Abrams, Mr. Hello. Greg Brady, Ms. Rachel Bruce, myself, Karen Ungerer. Um, our lawyer this evening, our counsel is Kelly Norton, and our recording secretary is Jessica McLennan. Did you mention Rachel? Yes. Didn't I? No, you did. You did. No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> all right. Let's look at this agenda. Um, executive session, we have none. Uh, approval and acceptance of previous minutes. Has everyone read the minutes of uh, February 9th? Yep. Do I have a motion to accept those minutes? I'll make the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, we saw your hand, Craig. Okay. Uh, new business, we have none. So we'll move right on to the action on decisions. Uh, the first one is Woodbury Chicken LLC. Uh, review draft decision for variances for construction of a Popeye's restaurant for village code sections 310-27 and chapter 310 attachment 11 relative to the number and size of signs, including landscaping. Said property is located at 20 Center Drive, Central Valley, section 225, block 3-1, I'm sorry, <laughs> block three, lot 1.12. And the decision is as follows, several pages of facts and findings. And our decision is, as a consequence of the board's discussions, the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants the requested area variances described and discussed above to the extent notice above, noticed above, noted above, wow. And hereby finds that the variances as granted are the minimum variances necessary to preserve and protect the character of the neighborhood. Per section A316-9 of the Village Code, this decision shall expire if a building permit is not obtained by the applicant within 180 days from the date of this decision. Should the proposal also require approval from the Village of Woodbury Planning Board, the 180-day expiration window shall run from the date of final planning board approval. The board may extend this time for one additional period of 90 days if such extension is warranted by the particular circumstances. Um, do I have a motion to accept this decision? This favorable I'll, decision. I'll make a motion. Okay. Um, second. I'll, I'll Craig. Okay. Sorry. How do you vote, Kevin? Aye. Craig. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Andrew. Aye. And I vote aye. So, um, Woodbury Chicken gets their variances. I still love the name of that Woodbury Chicken. I know. <laughs> Okay, um, next is NMJ Caesar PE slash Choi review draft decision for variances for the construction of a single family residence, whereas <coughs> pursuant to section 310-7, properties in the R2A district are required to have a minimum lot width of 175 feet. And pursuant to section 310-12, properties in the R2A district are required to have a minimum street frontage of 100 feet. The application proposes a minimum lot of 50 feet and 81.75 feet of street frontage. 
Said property is located at 372 Route 32 Central Valley, Section 218, Block 1, Lot 42.2. And once again, after several pages of facts and findings, as a consequence of the board's discussions, the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants the requested area variances described and discussed above to the extent noted above, conditioned on the applicant receiving all necessary permits from the building department for any proposed construction within the water quality overlay district, and hereby finds that the variances as granted are the minimum variances necessary to preserve and protect the character of the neighborhood. For a section A316-9 letter E of the village code, this decision shall expire if a building permit is not obtained by the applicant within 180 days from the date of final submission approval by the planning board. The board may extend this time for one additional period of 90 days if such extension is warranted by the particular circumstances. Do I have a motion to accept this decision? I'll make that um, motion. <laughs> okay, do I have a second? Thank you. Oh, okay. Craig, was your hand up for the first? Doesn't matter. Okay, that's all right. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, Kevin, how do you vote? Aye. Craig? Aye. Uh, Rachel? Aye. Um, Andrew? Aye. And I aye. vote aye. So Woodbury Chicken will, I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Choi. <laughs> thank you. Thank get, you. <laughs> get to build his house there. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate the time and effort in that. Uh, Good luck to you guys. To see both of you there. Next on the agenda is the uh, action on decisions for Mendel Mendelovitz. Review draft decision requesting an interpretation of accessory use number seven on the schedule of zoning district regulations for the R3A district and for an area variance to permit the keeping of livestock, chickens and roosters on a parcel having less than two acres with less than 200 feet from a property line. Whereas pursuant to section 310-7 accessory uses, a minimum of two acres of lot area is required and a minimum distance of 200 feet to property lines for housing and grazing. Said property is located at 72 Summit Avenue, Central Valley, section 228, block two, lot four. And once again, several pages of facts and findings. And the decision is, as a consequence of the board's discussions, the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby denies the requested interpretation and area variances described and discussed above. Do I have a motion to uh, accept this decision? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Kevin. Do I have a second? I'll second it. All in favor? Uh, Kevin? Aye. Uh, Craig? Aye. Aye. Gotcha. Rachel? Aye. And Andrew? Aye. And I vote aye. All righty. Next is Eastgate Management. Review draft decision for an area variance from the required side yard setback, whereas pursuant to section 310-7, a minimum side yard setback of 30 feet is required and 22.7 feet is provided. Said property is located at 300 Forest Road, Central Valley, Section 213, Lot 1, Lot 63. And the decision for that, once again, several pages of facts and findings. As a consequence of the board's discussions, the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants the requested area variance described and discussed above to the extent noted above, conditioned on the applicant receiving all necessary permits from the building department and hereby finds that the variance as granted is the minimum variance necessary to preserve and protect the character of the neighborhood. For section A 316-9E of the village code, this decision shall expire if a building permit is not obtained by the applicant within 180 days from the date of final submission approval by the planning board. The board may extend this time for one additional period of 90 days if such extension is warranted by the particular circumstances. Do I have a motion to uh, except this decision. I'll okay. make the motion. Okay, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Do I have a second. second? Second. Thank you, Andrew. All right, Greg, uh, Kevin, how do you vote? Aye. Greg? Aye. Gotcha. Rachel? 
Aye. And Andrew. Aye. And I vote aye. Okay. So he gets to put that addition on his house. All righty. Okay. Oh, Next, on page yeah. two already. What was that? We're on page two already. Yeah, page two, number five. <laughs> I need a drink. Okay, we're up to public hearings. Ear world, continuation of public hearing requesting variances from one, section 310-32B to exceed the square footage for a retail establishment. Number two, section 310-30D, number two, D, to allow an additional wall sign in excess of what is permitted. And three, attachment 11 of chapter 310 to allow additional wall sign area in ex excess of what is permitted. Said property is located in the LC zoning district at 159 State Route 32 in Central Valley, is known on the Village of Woodbury tax maps as section 226, block one, lot 9.2. Um, is the applicant present? We are. Oh, I see you. Okay. All right, so it's been a few months since you've been here. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, recap. Yeah. Uh, Harry, are you sitting in the dark? I'm not, why? <laughs> it looks not. like you are, okay. Yeah. I'm in the dark? No, uh, I have the lights on. Are you um. still? <laughs> All right. Um, so it's been a few months since you've been here and you have amended the um, application, but you did ask us also to consider the original application. So as it stands now, you originally wanted um, variances for the signage, for the number of signs and the square footage of the sign. And you wanted um, variances, a variance for the square footage of the building. Yes. Well, you've amended that application and you've reduced the size of the building and gotten rid of what variances might be needed for the signs. Correct so far? That is correct. Okay. So what we've done, what you've done is you've reduced your um, total size from 15,110 square foot to 13,105. The retail went from 11,840.5 square feet down to 10,860.5 square feet. It's, it is a decrease, but it's still 36% over what is um, allowed. And yep. the retail, uh, you went from, I'm sorry, the uh, redemption, you went from 3,000 to 2,000, which was a 33% decrease. So overall, you have 12,861 square feet and 8,000 is, is allowed. So that's 60.8% over what's allowed. Yes. Um, you don't need any variances for the signs if we consider the second application. Uh, then, um, have, then you, I'm sorry, what? No, I just, the, the, the variance is purely for the size of the, of the retail, the single right. retail establishment, not for the size of the building. The building is permitted to be as large oh, yeah. as the original application of the 15,110. Um, and we are seeking, because we are not dividing that space, uh, we would require a variance. And that is the variance that we were requesting. Right. And that's the 12,000, the, the whole building being 12,000, whole area being 12,000. Yes. Uh, 800. Okay. 60 square feet. Now you submitted um, a new traffic study. Um, yep. Would you care to elaborate on that? On the. Um, I'm hoping that. The uh, I'm, between the. Uh, you yeah, know, I, I, I can jump in on that. Oh, uh, thank you. So. Good evening, Carlito Holt with DTS Provident. Uh, we are the traffic engineering consultant on the project. We prepared an original traffic impact study uh, dated March 3rd, 2021 uh, that we submitted to the planning board. We did receive comments from the planning board's traffic consultant, but had held off on formal responses while it went to zoning, but we understood that you know, traffic wanted to be considered as part of the zoning application. So we formally responded uh, to those comments that were raised by the traffic engineering consultant. The, the key takeaways from, from the updated study were we went out and performed actual traffic counts and parking counts at two existing Deer World facilities 
to get actual trip generation and parking generation rates for the current operations and then use that to generate what the traffic would be for the proposed facility. Uh, the other uh, aspect was we are now proposing a dedicated left turn lane on 32 to enter the site, uh, which you know is, a, is, a, is an enhancement from the existing operation. Not only are we consolidating the access, which is right now a wide open access along the entire frontage, but consolidating down to a more conventional access and providing the dedicated left turn lane so uh, vehicles can safely turn in without uh, being in the live lane of traffic that's traveling northbound on 32. Um, so with respect to zoning, we also looked at um, you know, it, what the zoning implications would be with the proposed use versus if you, if you actually did 15,000 square feet of uh, retail spread across multiple buildings, so it wouldn't exceed the 8,000 square foot level. And what we found was that it, it did not generate significantly more traffic uh, during the PM and Saturday periods. And, and in the AM period, it would generate less traffic because the beer world isn't open. So uh, from a traffic <laughs> impact in, well, standpoint- at eight o'clock in the morning, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, no, too early, I think. <laughs> Um, so, you know, from a traffic impact standpoint, I think the, the zoning aspect is, is agnostic as far as what type of traffic it would generate. Now, what about, um, I know we were, there was some concern about the, the Oakland Avenue and Route 32 there, and it, there was some discussion of the signal, but of course, at this time, there's no signal planned. It's being considered, but we don't know which way it's going to go. Correct. And, and um, you know, I guess to provide a little more, more color on that, you know, obviously there is the, the proposed uh, Marriott Hotel application directly across the street from the beer world, as well as the Avalon Hotel project, which is immediately south of the Marriott project. So as it stands right now, the Marriott project is proposing a dedicated left turn lane on southbound 32 that would turn into Turner Road. The Avalon project is proposing a new, a new driveway or roadway that would come out opposite Oakland Avenue. And the thought would be, if, if DOT permits it, that a traffic signal would go in at that location. And I know the various applications are all working with the department. And I, I, I see uh, Chairman Gerber is, is on tonight, too, so he could probably provide some color around it as well. But, you know, they're, they've, they've actually are going to approach the DOT to really get them to reconsider uh, having a traffic signal at Oakland Avenue, because I think everyone sees that as a benefit to the corridor. Anything else you'd like to add about the traffic, the, the questions that were posed on the traffic study? No, I think that that's it for now. Does it, uh, concerning the traffic study, does anybody on the board have any questions? I did want to mention to the board, um, I know I sent an email out late today, so I'm not sure if everybody got to see it. You did get responsive comments from the village's traffic engineer on this matter. Um, I have not had a chance to review it. I don't know if all of you have. Um, if you would like, I can ask your traffic engineer to attend your meeting next month if you have any questions that you want to ask him about it. Yeah, I think we will discuss that later. Can we do that? because I don't know what everybody feels. All right. Um, so if, if we're not talking about, I know that when this application came before us, the idea was to make the beer world in Woodbury the flagship store. I guess my question is why Woodbury? It's uh, <clears throat> the traffic on the road on, on Route 32 and the number of, um, you know, people that travel through the area make it a desirable location for beer world. Um, with given the reduction in the overall size of the uh, of the store, um, at this point we are not uh, we're not looking to make this a flagship store. We're looking to make this a profitable store, um, based upon similar stores that have been built uh, by Beer World recently. Uh, we've reduced the overall uh, footprint of the of the beer world store to what we feel would be a profitable um, profitable size. 
uh, in comparison, uh, the store in Pine Bush is, is 9,000 square feet and is not a profitable store. Um, is it still open? Yes, it is. It opened um, right at, uh, Lewis is on this call. He can help me out if, if I'm wrong, but it opened towards the end of 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. yeah, roughly a full year. How many square feet is the one in Monroe? Do you know offhand? Monroe is, uh, I believe it's somewhere walls there. We have stuff. Uh, it, our, our platform doesn't fit there. We don't have all the product that we would like to have in that store. Yeah. The Monroe, is, or the is Monroe that in Monroe? Store. You're talking about Monroe? That you don't have the product in Monroe that you would like to have? Oh, That's we don't. Is that uh, a profitable store? Uh, that store is, uh, yeah, it's profitable, but um, that store and big you're breaking up yeah kevin did you want to say something no i'm just saying i just said you know monroe's not that big no that's so, what i was asking so also, oh sorry go ahead rachel no, just one other thing. I just a point of clarification. So to my understanding, Pine Bush also doesn't have very many bars or uh, alcohol facilities in general. So I just, um, do you think that that plays into sort of the detriment? I'm just trying to think because Woodbury doesn't necessarily have that many bars either. I'm trying to think if that plays into the, the profits that the store is able to generate. Yeah, you know, I mean, do, do you guys do any research on the clientele that will, you know, use you know the stores that, that you build or do you do, do you just look at the location or do you look at the uh you know the people in the community and, and and what's around because i know that woodbury you know many of the residents that i know personally um they prefer to shop at local you know local business small business owners whereas beer world would be more of a i guess they would call it a chain or a franchise type thing well family owned you know it's it, yeah it, Family and uh, I, I, you know, we do have a few stores, but I wouldn't really consider us a chain. Or, you know, we're just building as we go. Use the LA um, uh, website for certain points of where we're going to build a store. So they uh, they have like maps online. So we find a certain area. Woodbury's just been part for the last few years. We get into that community. Because I, I just, I think for me personally, I, I don't know that this, it's, it's the size that makes the store unprofitable. I'm, I'm not sure that it's the size, you know, that mm -mm. that's the determining factor. So you, you, with new builds, uh, which is what we're looking at, you know, comparing this store to the Monroe store, I don't think is, is, is very fair. Um, Monroe store is an existing store. It was, it was a, uh, it was something that Beer World took over and has been operating. Um, it's an older store. It doesn't fit their product, as they said. Um, when you're talking about new construction, um, the costs are the the carrying costs are significantly higher. Construction costs are significantly higher, especially given the climate climate of what is going on now. Um, and in order to make a a, a store profitable that isn't a second gen store. And what I mean by that is occupying a space that was previously occupied by another tenant. Um, Beer World is looking for, you know, looking to establish themselves in Woodbury with one of their stores. Um, and in order to do that and display the 4,000 plus um, uh, beers that they're capable of doing or they like to do, uh, that's what's determining the size of this store. And the ability to provide a diverse, diversified product specifically relating to the craft brews, um, that is what makes the new beer world um, a de desirable location to beer drinkers. And um, 
and it's also makes it profitable for uh, for beer world. Um, if they're only able to display a couple thousand uh, beers, it's far less desirable for the 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 um, the beer connoisseur because they're not able to get those uh, the the unique brews that are only really found at a beer world. So a couple of thousand brands or flavors or whatever you call them of beer wouldn't be enough. It has to be, you said you had a 4,000 beers. I didn't realize there was that many. I didn't either. <laughs> well, I don't drink beer, so I wouldn't know, but I always thought there was like a dozen. No, no, it's, it's, it's thousands. And, and that is why, um, you know, what, that is the market that Beer World has established themselves. <laughs> It, it's the uh, the ability to go into a store and get unique brews from around primarily around the Northeast and around the country. Um, you know, small craft brewers uh, that are able to sell to a beer world store. Um, you know, and, and display their product. Uh, there's people that travel uh, from over an hour away to get to a beer world store based upon certain releases of certain beers. Um, you know, and, and a lot of those, peop those people are coming from the South. Uh, so Beer World Woodbury would be a nice location for them to stop as opposed to driving all the way up to Kingston or Chester or Middletown. Okay. And relating to, you know, the, the idea that this is a chain or a franchise, it is not a franchise. E each, of these, each of these stores is owned um, by the beer world owner. This is not a franchise. Uh, you know, you don't have somebody that buys a franchise and starts selling, you know, selling the beers. Um, it's not dissimilar to Cosmo's restaurant, which is right down the road. Um, they have multiple locations, but are family owned. Uh, it's not significantly dissimilar to that. It is certainly not a, a chain, um, you know, in terms of uh, Outback Steakhouse or any of these other large chains, uh, large retail stores. It's not a Dollar General with thousands of locations. Uh, currently, Beer World is operating 10 locations and primarily in Orange, Ulster, and Sullivan counties. Um, you know, the, the, the owner of Beer World uh, lives right in Monticello, um, you know, and their headquarters are in, in Middletown. This is not a, this is not a large chain. This is a locally owned, um, you know, the, uh, business with multiple locations. Anybody have any questions on the board? Uh, I'm pretty good. All right, we do, concerning the traffic, do you wanna have the village traffic consultant come to the next meeting and it, you know? Is that up to us? You is, that up to the, is that up to us or is that up to the applicant? No, that is up to you. You you can bring your own traffic consultant to the meeting. Um, like I said, he did write a report um, and I sent it to you, but I just sent it to you right before the meeting. So I don't know if, I, I know Kevin said he didn't check his email from me before the meeting. I don't know if everybody else had a chance to, but um, it might be be beneficial to the board to take a look at that report, have a chance to digest it and have any questions answered by your traffic consultant at the next meeting. Do we need to decide at this time whether he comes or should we look at the report? Because I don't think any of us have studied the report. Well, Karen, if it's okay with you, if we're going to do that for next month, let's have him on and let him give us his interpretation. Since, you know, we're going to take the time to do it anyway, I'd like to hear uh, what, you know, the traffic con consultant would say, if, you know, if that's all right with everybody else on the board. I'm okay with that. I agree. Yeah. I mean, as much as I know, um, as m there's something that I would like to hear more about what he has to I, think. I, I'm, I'm waiting to have. Oh. Do we do we have to open this up for public comment or yeah, do we, we have to? Well, if it's, it's public hearing. We got, I'll open it up, but I just want to ask the board what they wanted to do. 
as far as consultant. So everybody on board with having um, village traffic consultant come to the next meeting? I am. Uh, okay. All right, the majority. I didn't ask you, Craig, personally, but. <laughs> 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 Smiling, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, before you board, have any more questions before I open it up to the public? No? All right, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this application? And I think Rachel was going to ask something. Oh, sorry, Rachel. Sure, no, it's okay. No, I understand that a lot of this, uh, a lot of uh, the conversation was had by the board um, before I was um, able to, before I was brought on. Um, but my only concern relates to just um, looking at the map right now and just looking at how close the uh, the back of the proposed facility would be to a residential neighborhood and what the sort of proposed disturbance would be as far as that. So I just wanted to throw that into the mix as well. Yeah, they did move it forward a little to provide more of a buffer. Okay. But it's still not, you know, a great amount, but but they did they did move it slightly forward. Got it. Yeah. Thank it, you. It, thank it, you for clarifying that. Would you could I respond to that? Mm -hmm, sure. So the buffer isn't uh, significant, but it is significantly more than if they divided this building uh, up into multiple stores. We don't need to be here if we show multiple storefronts. Um, we could do two retail uh, businesses in this building, divide them in half and have them roughly 7,500 square feet a piece. And that building would be an additional 2,000 square feet, which we did show a site plan for. And the buffer to the rear residential properties was significantly less than we currently show. If this application is denied and we go back to a 15,000 square foot building uh, with multiple tenants in it, we wouldn't have to appear before this board. And there are, we would have to work with the planning board on buffering uh, through vegetation primarily, um, but we wouldn't need, we, we could go to the larger building. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you for your response and, and for clarifying that. Um, this might fall probably more to the planning board, but I think it would be worth considering maybe um, just given that even though, as you mentioned, the buffer is in, um, it's better, but not great, um, at least considering maybe planting evergreen trees or some kind of vegetation in between. So at least there's a little bit more of a separation between the residential area um, and the proposed site. But that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, we provided a landscaping plan that demonstrates that. Got it. Thanks. Anyone else from the board? Anyone from the public? Maria Hunter has her hand raised. I don't even see her on here. Oh, she's up there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> okay, Karen. On the... Go Good ahead, Maria. Everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, everyone keeps talking about um, it's a family-owned business or however you want to describe it. Then who owns the place in New Windsor? No one ever mentions the beer world in New Windsor. Is this part of the, the family owned business out of curiosity? No one wants Matt, to answer me? He's unmuting himself. Just give him a minute. Hello. The New Windsor store sold off to somebody a few years ago. It was a family member that purchased into it but uh that one is is not really part of our i think you're breaking up mr casanza okay all right so apparently the gentleman who just spoke he does they don't own that but does anyone know how what the square footage of that building is by chance if it was previously owned because that building it's huge and if that's about the same size building that we want here in woodbury I'm totally against it with the variance for whether it's like you said, Karen, it's what 4,000 square feet approximately oversized and what we want. And what is maybe uh, council can answer this question. Um, what was said a little while ago, they can pull this application and go before the planning board and put a 15,000 square foot split mini mall in there without a beer world. Is that correct? 
They are asking for a variance from section 31032B for retail shops. So it says that no single retail establishment shall exceed 8,000 square feet except a supermarket, which shall not exceed 40,000 square feet. So they would be able to have, I think what his, his point was, was that it's they're here because this is a single retail establishment exceeding 8,000 square feet. So if they were able to fit a larger building on there that was greater than 8,000 square feet and was not a single retail establishment, they would be able to have. And I think he just used the 15,000 square feet as a number Randomly. because that was a, a prior proposal for this application that was then subsequently reduced. Correct. All right. I just want to be clarify that so other people who are listening or who will view this uh, video it's like if we don't get this then we'll we can go back to what we want we can have a multi-store building put in that can fit code and it would exceed what they're asking for as a single business um but i do i still stand with i don't think we need such a large building in that area and and i'm sorry we do have a winery, meadery, north end of town. We have one, two, we have four or five areas that do have bars that people can go to. So we, we, we do have an area that if we get other people who want to come visit Woodbury, they have a way to go to have adult beverages. So, this you know, a, this is not a this bar. Is a, this, is a, this is a, may I, mm -hmm. may I finish speaking? I don't know who spoke, but this is, you know, this is a bedroom community. People drive through Woodbury. As everyone knows, we have businesses. We don't have what we like Warwick has or Cornwall has. This is a different type of town. And to premise of saying that, oh, this hotel is going to be built. We don't know they're going to go through. So you can't base that. You have to base this application just on their application as if nothing else is being considered. And I'm sorry, but that's how I feel about this application. And I thank the board for listening to me. Thank you, Maria. Anyone else from the public care to speak to this application? Karen, it's Sandy Capriglione. I would, I just have a question about the traffic study. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Mr. Marshall, did you say that the traffic, or excuse me, I guess it was Mr. Holt. Did you say the traffic study was based on the other two stores? Yeah, we, we did we, we did traffic counts during the uh, peak hours of the of the other two stores and actually got the total entering and exiting traffic volumes and related that to the size of each of the stores to come up with a trip generation rate per square foot and then applied it to the proposed square footage of this store. Okay, so I guess my question is, does that make sense when you said, I mean, you, you freely admitted that one of the stores does poorly? Well, we took the average of the two. Okay, but I mean, if, if both of those stores were very successful stores, wouldn't that trip generation then be higher? Uh, potentially. Okay, so something right on 32 in a highly trafficked corridor. I, I just don't know that, that there's, uh, to me, it doesn't make sense that, that that traffic study, the basis of that traffic study is is totally accurate. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not a, a traffic no. analyst. Yeah. But. Understood. Yeah, if, if it, so what we assumed is all of the trips were destination trips. So if it captures traffic that's already traveling by on 32, that's not really a new trip to the, to the roadway network. It would be a trip in and out of the, the site, but you're not adding to uh, roadway uh, capacity volumes up and down the 30, 32 corridor. Okay. All right. Thank you. So Thank you don't you. think that that stops that are occurring as a result of traffic that's already there is 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 impactful to the traffic study? Well, what, 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 what we're providing a dedicated left turn lane, so it wouldn't stop that traffic on 32. The traffic would, would queue up in its own turn lane and the through traffic going northbound could bypass it. How many cars do you think you can fit on that left turn lane? Uh, I'd have to go back and check, but 
I think we had, a, we were about 150 foot left turn lane. So that could store about uh, seven to eight vehicles. And uh, just to further follow up on that question is, um, has the New York State DOT weighed in on that? They, they came back on our initial application, they came back and requested that we provide a dedicated left turn lane. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? So or that questions? was probably, I'm sorry, Karen, but just no, on go this ahead. Process, go ahead, Andrew. So if, if the DOT is saying that we have to provide a left turn lane, so the traffic is gonna be impactful, correct? Uh, just as a result of the traffic that already exists. Well, I think that the left-hand turn is not, so it doesn't back up the traffic yeah. going straight. You know, but uh, uh, my own the reason I'm asking that is because if we're looking at just destination trips, I don't necessarily think that that's going to be the most accurate depiction of the business that's going to be entering and exiting this store on Route 32. That's that that I guess that's that's you know, um, the 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 part and, and and you know our consultant can weigh in on that and, and you know let us know what he thinks as well, but. I guess I didn't realize that this was just looking at destination trips and not uh, trips that you know are going to occur as a result of just the traffic that's occurring anyway. Yeah, and, and what I was getting at with the destination trips is, is in reality, some of the trips that we analyzed in our traffic study are going to be what we call pass-by trips. So you're, you're driving home on 32, you swing in, you grab something and, and then you leave and go back on your way. So any intersection to the north or south would have already experienced that trip uh, regardless of the proposed project. And that, that was my point is that we conservatively assumed that there weren't any pass by trips, but the, the amount of traffic turning in and out is, is what it is. It's just that there would potentially be less traffic north and south from the proposed project. I mean, I just don't know how you could take Pine Bush and Monticello and compare it to what drives on Route 32. Monticello is one of their most profitable stores. I don't care about profit. I care about number of cars. Yeah, we looked at the, uh, the, the volumes because Monticello is along a state route as well. And, and the, the volumes that it gets on a daily basis is, 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 in, is comparable to Route 32. The volume of cars traveling past is comparable to Route 32? Right. The volume of cars that are, that are passing both directions of the Monticello store is comparable to what's going to be passing the Route 32 store? Correct. And what about the other store? Uh, that one would be lower, and we saw that the counts were lower at that one. I just sort of wanted to jump off that and raise another concern as well. So aside from one thing I would uh, encourage maybe uh, considering, even though the new Windsor facility is not owned by the same uh, family anymore, it's still similar in, in signage and uh, name recognition. And to the average Joe, no way would realize that they aren't owned by the same, by the same uh, company. Um, and I was wondering if it would be possible to consider th take those numbers into account. Because I think that New Windsor's facility will probably be a little bit more similar to what we would see in Woodbury in terms of um, location and the size of the community. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to bring into uh, consideration, one thing that really concerns me and that I hope that we can hear from the traffic consultant at the next meeting would be just people running across from the proposed hotel to Beer World and back again. Um, we see the volume of traffic on 32. Um, it's no, it's common knowledge. You essentially take your life in your hands when you run across. Um, and that's something I also want to make sure that we um, take into consideration. Good point. Mm -hmm. Anyone else from the public? May I speak once more? Madam sure. Chair, Maria Hunter. Yep, yep go ahead. Uh -huh. um, until we get our traffic consultant to review this, Good. The left lane, the left hand turn lane going northbound, that's a pinch point area right there, as it currently stands right now. With this traffic study, you can I because I have I haven't seen it myself. Has anyone taken into consideration accident history of that particular area because of the sight distance 
I understand that the driveway is going to be narrower, but as it stands right now, you take your life into your hands when you had to come out of there, whether you're going north or south, because the traffic, the speed limit, people do not do the speed limit through there. So there's a number of concerns with that traffic study that maybe you can ask your traffic consultant to take a look at and look at the history of accidents that may have occurred there because to put a left-hand turning lane in there, it's gonna confuse everyone. You go a couple hundred feet further north, then it turns into a, a center turning lane and it's gonna, it's gonna make people confused. And I don't see where they're gonna get the land to make that road wider to put a center turning lane in, I mean, a left-hand turning lane in. So those are just another concerns that you can ask your consultant when you reach out to him. Thank you. Okay. Anything else anyone has to say before we continue the public hearing for, for next month? No? Do I have a motion to continue the public hearing? Carry I'll on. make a motion that we carry it on to April 13th. 13th. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we will see you next month. and. Uh, We'll try to have our traffic consultant here. So uh, possibly you can answer any of his concerns and vice versa. Would, would we be able to get a copy of uh, his comments? Yeah, I was just gonna say, Larry and Carlito, I will send you his report um, tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just so that yeah. we, are, we, we are aware of the comments and, and, and we can um, be prepared to respond to them. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Next on the agenda, next public hearing is 14 Castleton Drive, LLC, continuation of public hearing appealing the determination of building inspector Michael Pinella that the use of the property as a commercial business, including uses such as private catering events, a wedding venue, a restaurant, and place of assembly is outside the approved special permit use and the issuance of a notice of violation of zoning and order to cease same. Said property is located in the R1A zoning district at 14 Castleton Drive in Highland Mills and is known on the village of Woodbury tax maps as section 202, block one, lot 70. Is the applicant present? Ben Gailey from Jacobo Tungubitz is representing the applicant tonight. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so what you're doing is, is appealing the building inspectors uh, finding that uh, Ms. Pelvis, and uh, he's operating a commercial business from a single family dwelling. And his, he, your, you, the applicant, contends that the private catering events, the weddings, the restaurant, the assemblies, the groups of people that come there, um, I'm sorry, this, the building inspector's point of view, his finding is based on the um, spe special permit that was issued, that this is outside the purview of the special permit issue. And that was issued um, and in violation of the section 310-7. You contend that um, the former building inspector allowed these activities and they're in accordance with chapter 243 of the village code. So one is one of you is determining, making your determination based on um, chapter 243, and the other one is based on the special permit that was issued. And the 243 is uh, not part of the zoning code, but it's a public assembly regulation. And there are a host of requirements. Um, you have to apply 60 days in advance. Uh, you have to pay a fee. Um, you have to get permits for whatever. If um, there are time constraints, uh, if it's less than 200 people, the building inspector can uh, determine whether to approve it or not. And if it's more than 200 people, the planning board has to do that. And you submitted um, a packet with several exhibits in it. One was the violation order. Um, one was an email with a response, but no question. We're not sure what the question was at the time. And the other was some aerial and uh, ground views of the property. So the violation order, and then I'll read it to you. It says, uh, this property slash business has been found to be operating as a commercial business 
from a single family dwelling and such uses are outside of the approved special permit conditions. Activities including, but not limited to private catering events, wedding venues, use as a restaurant and use as a place of assembly. The issued special permit was for the operation of a four room bed and breakfast, whereas the only meal served to guests of the bed and breakfast will be breakfast. Violations are to the village code sections 310-7 and 96.1. And this was dated, where is this dated? <laughs> oh, here it is, October 7th, 2021. Um, so then you also sent a um, response that, that uh, the building inspector had said, yes, these activities are allowed. You would need to fill out the application in its entirety, pay the fee a minimum of 60 days before each event, and he attached an application. The question was uh, from Mr. Pulver about being allowed to throw a few parties a year under the permit for the special assembly, for the public assembly. So that was that. And then you, um, whoops, uh, you gave us some photos, which obviously the property is gorgeous. There's no doubt about that. Um, so basically we have two courses of action. Um, we have to review the use of the property for the events to decide if they're either covered or not covered under the special permit, because that's part of the um, zoning code. And in a letter, um, July 20th, 2020, the building inspector said that the, the letter that he wrote, I guess he had asked about some um, activities that he wanted to hold at the property. This letter does not grant permission to operate this as a commercial use other than the bed and breakfast and is subject to the restrictions contained in the special permit, which received planning board approval. So we have to decide whether these weddings, restaurant use, public assembly are outside of that purview or not. But we cannot determine whether your use, whether, whether it's allowed under chapter 243 because chapter 243 is not part of the zoning code. So what comment would you have for that? <laughs> well, the building inspector is also charged with enforcing the zoning code and by um, stating that he would allow uh, wedding events there um, he was also stating that there's compliance with the zoning code. Now, in terms of the current building inspector stating that um, with, re with reference to um, the meals are limited to breakfast to the bed and breakfast guests, that doesn't say that meals cannot be provided to non bed and breakfast guests. But that's, that's not really the point here. And I want to say too, there's, there's no restaurant use of the property. So I don't understand that comment from the building inspector. But from our perspective, the prior building inspector authorized wedding events on the property, whether that's pursuant to the public assembly law or the zoning law isn't important. He authorized wedding events. And this board has the authority to determine that wedding events is an accessory use to a bed and breakfast use. And in fact, the courts have held that that is the fact. And we give you a case, it's a the Brophy case that was decided a couple of years ago that wedding events is an accessory use. Uh, the other point here is that in reliance on the former building inspector's determination that wedding events were permitted on the property, our client um, expended considerable uh, amounts of money both in advertisements and also in purchasing uh, furnishings and equipment for the wedding events in reliance on that determination by the building inspector and has carried out many wedding events on the property since then. And there's been no change in the use of the property over the last many years. The wedding events have continued as they have in the past with no complaints from the neighbors our understanding is the only complaint that was made and the reason the violation notice was issued was from a competitor and the, the neighbors around there support what's happening. And not all of them. Well, that I, was my understanding. I, I'm looking through the emails that were sent between Ms. Polar and the building inspector and nowhere does it say that weddings are permitted. Um, 
Mr. Pover no, but it, said, no, but it says that the public assemblies are permitted, which which includes uh, the wedding events, which is all he sought to do for well, for the most part. Well, well to be fair, I think what the chairwoman is saying is that that email that you are relying on, the question is omitted from that. And he wasn't asking about wedding events. He said he would like to throw a few parties, few parties a, year. a year. There's no description of that as being a wedding event. And I think we can agree that they're two very different things. And I think Gary said that that is not allowed in a single family residence. Well, no, no, it's approved as a bed and breakfast. Right. But the other stuff that Gary said is not allowed in a single family residence. I read all those emails back yeah. and forth. You're talking about the former building inspector? No, he, yeah, he, I didn't see, I didn't he see was anything. okay with the quote public assembly use, which includes wedding events. That's why he sent the email, which said that. Well, I want to get off of the issue of yeah. public assembly events. That is not something that is actually before this board right now. They have no ability to determine whether this was a public assembly or not, um, because that's under Chapter 243. They are limited to what is before them, which is the enforcement. And as the chairwoman said, the building inspector, he has the authority to enforce the zoning code, which he's done here by issuing a notice of violation to the applicant, saying that they're exceeding that approval granted by the planning board, which was for the bed and breakfast that you referenced. So now the board has to determine, review this uh, violation and determine whether the proposed use of the property for these events exceeds the approval granted by the planning board. And the, the special permit for the bed and breakfast says does not prohibit wedding events, doesn't prevent public assemblies. The only thing it says is that the only meal is for breakfasts, but that's limited to the bed and breakfast guests. There's no limitation in terms of others who may visit the property. So the whole wedding party can fit in those four bedrooms that he's allowed to use. No, we're not saying that. We're saying that. Well, that's what you're saying. The bed and no. breakfast is not having a wedding. No, what, what, what we're also saying is, is that it, it's a customary accessory use to have wedding events at bed and breakfast. It happens at countless bed and breakfast well, should, facilities in the area. He should have asked for that when he went in front of the planning board last time. He, well, he that never was asked, years and years He never ago. got any permits, Mr. Gailey. Um, Mr. Gailey, oh, sorry. Um, are, 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 I mean, are, are, are the functions like, is it that someone like sets up a tent in the backyard or are they actually holding the actual function within the act, within the building itself? Mostly within the building. Okay. Right. It's a, they got a huge hall there. Yeah, I think you're probably all familiar with the property and the building. It's a huge building. It really can't be, it can't be used as a residence, obviously. It, it needs to be used for some type of, you know, commercial use, if you want to use that term. Um, but again, wedding events are, are very typical in residential areas, and in particular at bed and breakfast, which are permitted in most residential areas, including the village of Woodbury. It's really, it's a, it's a unique property. You, you, you all realize that. Been there for a long time, and it, none of this stuff started since Seth bought it. I mean, so all the other people that have owned that property just lived in it. Well, I think you Let's would all recognize it's not resident. possible to maintain that property and that building as a single family residence. Maybe Everyone back in the Gilded there. Age, but not now. Well, I, I think um, Council um, is correct because we have no control of the 243. And I right. think that if, if he hadn't, if he ha had applied for permits, for the events that he was holding, this wouldn't be before us. Well, but he was told he even got a copy of the application. And he never applied for the permits. Right. But again, the, the code, the building inspector at that time, he wouldn't have said you could have public assemblies there if that was prohibited by the zoning code, because he's also the enforcement officer for the zoning code. So right, he recognized because... at that time that wedding events is an accessory use to a bed and breakfast under the zoning code. Well, I can't guess what, what the former building inspector was thinking, but the building inspector did say 
you would need to apply 60 days in advance, pay a fee, fill out the application, et cetera, et cetera. And that was never done. Pursuant to 243. But by saying that, again, he couldn't have told Mr. Pulver, you can have public assemblies there under 243. And at the same time have said, oh, but by the way, you're prohibited from having a wedding event, i.e. a public assembly under the zoning code. That would have been inconsistent. He wouldn't have done that. But why does that have to be mutually exclusive? Why, why can't he grant, why can't a building inspector grant a special permit on its own less than 200 people granting a special permit an application comes in, the plans come in by granting that special permit, you're saying that the building inspector is enforcing that use for, for that property? No, I don't think the building inspector can grant a special permit but what he was saying by saying you're allowed to have public assemblies here is also he was saying you may have wedding events here. And by saying that, he was he saying that. wedding events are permissible as part of a bed and breakfast use. Well, I, don't, I, think, I think that that's because what if he granted a, a special, what if a special permit was applied for for a concert and the, the, the permit came in, would that mean that now an accessory use to a bed and breakfast by allowing that concert means that all concerts can be held there? No, that's a good point, but no, because the building inspector knew that it was wedding events that were under consideration. But well, his answer there's, there's was- There's been more than just wedding was, events. Right, if, if it would have- I missed that. I'm sorry. There's been more than just wedding events. Well, it's primarily wedding events. There are a few private you know, events that occur otherwise. Yeah, but it's mostly wedding events. I think also just to jump off of um, Andrew's point, typically, as, as many of you know, when you go to, um, th there are different fees and restrictions when you go to any venue to, you know, having a wedding versus having a birthday party are two very different things. Um, and this, I believe, is part of the reason why it requires more clientele, more people, et cetera. So I just want to throw that into the mix. Well, I think that the distinction is that the building inspector was enforcing the zoning code and what and you're referring to, to right, and that's and what what you are referring to in chapter 243. But the building inspector made it clear in his letter. He said, in accordance with the public assembly law, you would be allowed to do this. I I think I'm not making myself understood. No, when we're the not. building inspectors <laughs> when the building inspector said you may have public assemblies here. He was also saying you may have wedding events here. He couldn't have said you may have public assemblies at the same time have, and then have said, oh, but, you, but you're prohibited under the zoning code from having wedding events. That would have been contradictory. He wouldn't have said that. But, but according to the special permit, Mr. Gailey, not, not so again, you're saying that because he said you can have uh, uh, the special permit, let's not forget, right? It was, it was during COVID. I'm sure a lot of people were having uh, public assemblies outdoors. And I, I'm sure that was going on. But what, when, when a building inspector says, yes, you can have a public assembly based on this permit application and these conditions, does that then mean that I, I don't follow your logic? So just because that, that special assembly happens, does that then mean that the building inspector must allow all of those events to happen at that. No, he's very clear in his letter. He says each event. He has it in capital letters. In other words, you have saying... to apply, pay a fee, do everything for each event. And the, what he was referring to, um, Seth had said, I was uh, I was just following up to see if you made a decision about me being allowed to throw a few parties a year under the permitting process for public assembly. And Gary said in accordance with the public assembly law, you would be allowed to do this. You would need to fill out the application in its entirety and pay the fee a minimum of 60 days before each event. I've attached the application for your convenience. So he says nothing about weddings and saying, you know, I don't, I looked through all these emails. I never saw the word wedding. Is that the exchange that you're referring and ballrooms to? And, you know Mr. Gailey, is that the exchange that you're referring to? Or are you referring to something that we- No, that's, no that's, that, that's correct. Karen, we need to just stick to what we 
have to decide on. Yes, we, we are. The I don't care about the other one. We have to care. We have to well, what, care about yeah, What we have to do is decide. We have to determine whether these wedding events or whatever he has, we can call them wedding events, is outside the purview of the special permit because that's what the violation order is. It says. Um, but he is. It is in violation knows. of the um, village code section, this, that. Um, the issued special permit was for the operation of a four room bed and breakfast. Um, it doesn't say an accessory uses. It doesn't say anything about that, but we have to what? determine that whether he's going to be able to have weddings or whatever that we have no say in. Then I could, I could rent my house out for a wedding in my backyard. I mean, you just... You, you just, could if you've, got a, if you've got a special permit under section If I got a special permit. Right. So I think we're, we're confusing, I don't know, to me, this under three, seems... I'd have to go get a permit under 310-7. Not Which that is chapter 243. You would need a public assembly a... permit under 243, Kevin. But that's right? not There's... even in the zoning. I don't care that's about that. Correct. Right, no, right. I, I, right. That's, but see, that you're, you're basically making my point. From a zoning perspective, I have, and council, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see anything talking about accessory uses in terms of weddings or other large public assemblies, okay, at all. So, yeah, I, I don't may I jump in here? No, sir, not at the moment. Okay, uh, sorry. I, I, at this point, <laughs> I you were essentially, essentially, it is, it is not what may be customary, it's what's in code. That's what we are charged with determining, okay? The, the special permit was for a bed and breakfast, and I'm presuming that this is in the bed and breakfast overlay district. Is that correct, Kelly? I don't know. That, um, that didn't come into play until after this permit was issued in 2012. I would actually have to look to see if this property is located within the bed and breakfast district overlay, which I can do while, while you keep talking. <laughs> that's, that's fine. If it is in that overlay district, then the accessory uses are outdoor amenities such as decks, porches, fire pits, pools, and et cetera. Not actual use cases as in event types, right? So under the code, it's a bed and breakfast. It's a special permit for a bed and breakfast. And it's pretty straightforward. Now, none of that prohibits the owner from applying for, I'll call it a section 243 special permit for any event, 60 days in advance and paying the fee. They're two separate and distinct items and we should not be confusing them. Correct. In the context of what, unfortunately as has been pointed out, the email exchange with um, the prior building inspector code enforcement officer and the owner is incomplete. We don't see what the specific question was. We don't know what it was. Right, so we cannot intimate based on that what someone might have been thinking or what their response was in relation to. No, that was the question, Craig. What I read about a few parties a year. He want Seth wanted to know if he could throw a few parties a year. Gary said, "Yeah, that would be allowed under public assembly." Under public assembly, assembly two forty three, right. get right. a permit, right. do whatever, and right. yes, I, and I concur with that assessment. But right. that does not suggest that weddings are a, um, if you will, grandfathered use case right. for a bed and breakfast. I'm sorry. Right. Not the way our code is written. It may be something else elsewhere, but not here. This is not within the bed and breakfast overlay. Kelly? So it's not subject to those restrictions. Kelly, I have a question for you. Uh, the violation order, isn't that like basically on hold? with the courts until this decision is made by the ZBA? Is that it is, is by appealing about? a notice of violation to the ZBA, it stays the enforcement action before the local justice court. You're correct. <laughs> All right, that's what I, that's what I thought. Anybody Thanks. else for the board have anything before I, I have one letter here from uh, a resident that whose property, uh, 
is adjacent to 14 Castleton. Um, this is from January 12th, the letter stated. Um, my name is Lydie Picardo. Please forgive me if I'm saying it wrong. Um, homeowner of Sixth Bramer Way, the cul-de-sac immediately behind 14 Castleton. Um, they have an autistic child who's very sensitive to loud noises, especially at night. Constant noise coming from the backyard would be extremely, uh, an extreme behavior trigger for the son. Um, her husband is an officer in the New York Police Department. He works midnights, needs to rest, and due to COVID, he's been forced to work many different shifts. And if there were parties and weddings and whatever, um, he wouldn't be able to do that. Constant noise, music, and lights. Um, the parking lot is directly behind the property line. And she says, uh, also, occasional summer events have not been a disruption thus far. However, if this becomes a commercial business, these frequent events will become a potential issue. And that's from Lydie Picardo. Um, that's the only letter we received from anyone. Um, anyone else on the board have any questions before I open this up to the public? All righty. Anyone from the public wish to speak to this application? Maria has her hand raised. Oh, I see that. <laughs> she course. moves all over though. The, my screen, everybody shifts places. Go ahead, Maria. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again. Um, maybe council can correct me if I'm incorrect. Um, being that this was approved many years ago as a bed and breakfast, wouldn't this be grandfathered under their old code and not in the, in the new uh, district that was made currently? I wouldn't use the word grandfathered, but it is considered a pre-existing non-conforming use. It did receive approval, um, but I would have to look to see if that is a still a permitted use within that district, but I can tell you that it is not within the bed and breakfast district currently. Thank you. Well, I was, I was on the board when this was approved and we went through great pains to accommodate the owner to allow him to have the bed and breakfast and not live in the same building as the bed and breakfast. You can go back and check all the notes, everybody. I'm not going to go into that. But what I'm more concerned about is why can't the applicant go back to the planning board and amend his special permit for this bed and breakfast and say, I'd like to have maybe 12 get togethers, gatherings, whatever you want to call them within the permit for the bed and breakfast. Because if he's put all this extra furniture that he's purchased into this ballroom, it's gonna greatly reduce the number of people he can have in that room per the building code and the inspector. I know this because once you have a large area, you can have X amount of people. Once you start filling it with furniture and tables and chairs, it's greatly reduced. Why doesn't someone suggest to the applicant, go back and ask for an amendment to your permit. Maybe I can have one event a month or X amount of people. I mean, come on here. I mean, the, the events that are going on up there as a commercial business, it's insane. Do what everyone else in town does. Other businesses had to get permits and safety plans in place. I'm gonna cite the winery meadery down the road. If she had a large event, She's supposed to have a safety plan, a police plan, and everything else in place for her special permit. She's done it. She has a plan in place. Anyone else who has to have something, you have to have fireworks. You get a permit from the village. Boom, you're taken care of. Just go for the permits already or amend your plan if you can. And then we'd all be happy. And then we could say, whether it be a party a, a gathering or, or an initiation meeting or something or or one of the committees in Woodbury are having a meeting then he, he'd be covered maybe there's an amendment that could be done and enough of this already just do the proper thing as a resident of this village and follow the law that's all I need to say thank you thank you Maria anyone else from the public no All right. Hey, Madam, board, Chair, any more comments? Ma Madam Chair, just to clarify, what we're talking about here tonight is very 
uh, clear, right? We're, we're just talking about the appeal uh, of the decision. We're not talking about whether or not, for all we know, the applicant could very well be making a plan to do that, to request additional variances or to, to right. request. Uh, that's not what we're here tonight. No, we're here to interpret. Right. So we're just talking about the appeal from the applicant on the uh, violation order. Right. Whether him holding these events is within the special permit use or if it's not allowed because of, you know. And I just want to be clear, too. It's on the events that have already taken place. We're not talking about anything going forward. Right. This is just on the actions that he was violated for. Right. Whether or not the wedding events are within the special permit, the board has to consider whether those are customary accessory uses to an bed and breakfast. So what we'd like to do, and I, I understand all the comments tonight from the board and the public, what we'd like to do is to supplement our application and put before the board the question of whether or not um, these events are accessory uses because they're, like I said earlier, there is case law you know, from the courts which says that wedding events is an accessory use to bed and breakfasts. So we'd like to be able to you know, provide that information to the board and have the board consider that because that's part and parcel of the decision you have to make. Okay, so Kelly, is that so, that's something we can do, correct? They can supplement their application. They and certainly we can carry can. this over to next month. Yep. Okay. How many how many months are we going to end up keep pushing this off to keep him out of this violation order? That's why we sent a letter last month that there would be no more extensions. Yes, but the applicant has. The reason, right, you know what? You'll have reason. to reapply after he deals with the with the courts. I just think we need to get this off our plate. It, I just think that this is being delayed and delayed and delayed. It's been five months already. That's my personal opinion. That I think I think uh, we we have we owe it to the applicant to hear their complete application to to hear. Uh, you know, the, the applicant came before us tonight, stated the applicant's case. They wish to give us additional information for us to consider. Um, I, 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 I don't have a problem. My personal opinion, I don't have a problem getting that and, and, and rendering but don't it. You think that should go, don't you think that should go to the planning board first? Well, no, sure because again, no, we, so, so Kevin, my understanding is that the applicant is going to provide us uh, with documentation that the applicant feels uh, supports their claim for this violation. So as long as that's the case, that's correct. I'm willing to hear. It. I'm I'm willing I'm willing to hear it. I don't have a problem with it. But I don't There's, speak for the board. I'm just speaking for myself. This is not allowed in a single family residence. I, I kind of think it's cut and dry. Well, well it's, it's a bed and breakfast. It's a it's a single family residence. It's Yes, it's, it's definitely, it's called an existing family dwelling slash bed and breakfast for private use only. That's what the building inspector said to him. Maximum of 160 persons would be allowed in the ballroom. So is, I the, think public that comment, is the public comment still open? Can, I mean, we can vote on it, right, Kelly? Can't we decide if... We want. Oh yeah, to... we could decide if we. Yeah, we haven't closed the public hearing. I'm saying right. we can. We can determine if we want to allow the applicant to come back next month to present their proof that they have. Right. Right. Yeah. They're asking for you to adjourn so that they can supplement their application. That would keep the public hearing open so that the public has the opportunity to comment on any additional information that the applicant submits. So would it be appropriate for a motion to allow the, the this application to adjourn to next month? If the board believes so, then yes. Yeah. We so would vote I, would on like it. To, I would make that motion then. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take a roll call here because we seem to have some disagreement. Kevin, how do you vote? No. Greg? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Andrew? Aye. And I, I vote yes. Well, even if I voted no, it would still be yes. 
Um, so we will adjourn this, we will carry this meet public hearing over to next month where um, the applicant will give us the documentation. Um, please don't tell us that you don't have enough time because we've already <laughs> delayed several months here. Sure. And uh, it also we're, needs we're, to be submitted timely for the right, board yeah. to have right. reasonable time to consider it. Right. Is there a date that we have that we should submit by? Well, we prefer like two weeks, but 10 days will be fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so if you can get it in by April 1st, that would be yeah, almost in between the two. Yeah. Yeah. When's the next meeting? April, April 13th. Okay. We'll do that. All right. We'll okay. see you next month. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Good seeing you all. Have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, building inspectors report. We have none. Deliberations on closed public hearings. We have none. Adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. I'll make <laughs> okay, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> All righty. Thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everybody.